Uh, we got the main speaker here. We have another speaker too, but he's not here yet. Uh, he's got, I think he's still flying. Is he still? Yeah, they haven't gotten back yet. I guess. Uh, one of his students get a check right today for private, so he's trying to, you know, comfort the guy down. Uh, Okay, this is uh, the December 2018 uh, safety meeting for the Montero Club. And my name is Roger Mann. I'm the uh, clearing, clearing official. I'm the safety officer. I'm also a clearing official, too. And uh, we got John Law up here as our chief flight instructor, and Bob, who's our, our uh, uh, what is he? I don't oh, Aero Club manager. That's Let's it. Take out the trash. Yeah, that's, yeah, you do do that, don't you? Yeah, and let's see, Randy's not here. He has a cold, so he probably will not be here. Uh, and uh, I think that's about it. And we got Jason, who's the cameraman over here. Uh, he gets extra pay for that. Yeah. Uh, he's also one of our uh, instructors. So if you want to have him as your instructor, you can do that too. Uh, yeah, he's he, he charges a little bit more. Uh, it's quality. That's yeah, what I quality call it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we got David G back there, our uh, mechanic. Yay. Give him a good hand. Right. We're going to have, uh, again, we're going to have a guest speaker this month, the uh, same guy who did it last month, so if you didn't get bored last week, well, you probably didn't get bored this time. Uh, actually, it wasn't boring at all. So anyhow, yeah, and uh, Jim Hosey, he's going to be our talker tonight, so you don't have to watch me. And if Cliff gets back in here before the meeting, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, a little situation that took place with him uh, in his airplane, Triple uh, Five, actually, D-34, uh, which he lost an engine uh, flying. Uh, the engine quit on him, and he was able to get the airplane back here, and even though he landed in the overrun, <coughs> he did get the airplane on the ground. And then the engine started right after he got the plane on the ground. And he taxied it back. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, that's that's why Paul over there with ATC says we would like to have our airplanes come back with the engines going, you know, but then of course that doesn't always happen. So, you know, 2-9 uh, Foxtrot landed someplace else. That was one of the reasons why. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's get going here because I know Bob's got a lot of things he wants to talk about. <clears throat> you guys are in trouble again. Um, Okay, first thing we usually do is introduce new people if we have any of these. I don't, who's not been in our meeting before. Um, so Re returning after about a four year hiatus. And okay. I found myself not flying as much as I used to. I wanted to surround myself with uh, fine folk, and here I am. All right, yeah. And, uh, Okay, uh, let's see, because I know we've had, <clears throat> anybody else? Anybody else that's returned? Um, yeah, I don't think so. I'm thinking because the people that did return, so not all of them have, I mean, are here. Uh, we all returned to the safety meeting tonight. What more do you want? Well, you know. I mean, I, I'm glad you guys are putting up going to safety meeting just before Christmas. If Christmas was the same week, then I would move the safety meeting prior to. But, you know, Christmas is next week, so you lucky guys get to come now. All right. Anybody has gotten any new pilot ratings? Sold for the first time. Since I think we had a lot of people. Yeah, Jason. I got my commercial multi engine last Friday. All right. Yeah. And Mora, I know Mora's not here. Yeah, he Mora's not here. He, he got his, his uh, first solo. And then tonight, uh, right now, that, as we speak, that's uh, what is Paul happening Witt. to Paul Witt. He's getting his private pilot's license. And uh, I think he's. 
passed. We haven't heard anything. Yeah, we haven't heard anything yet, but uh, I, I assume the that, uh, <laughs> that if he gets in here, he'll let us know. Uh, okay, anybody got their license taken away from the FAA? <laughs> we do get that every once in a while. <laughs> you know, it does happen. And, uh, okay. All right. Now, I got there featuring Cliff. That's because he had the engine loss. Um, the, uh, he was supposed to be here, but then I, I, this, I think this check ride is taking a little bit longer. So, uh, uh, but does anybody have anything to share as far as experiences? So far as I know, the marine safety officer is not here to chastise you or anything like that. Uh, I got to fly a month ago with Mike Bangora. I don't know if I said his name yeah, right. He was close. So, yeah, it was a month ago uh, from the tower, and it was great because he says he doesn't like to fly. <laughs> but he wanted to experience and, and understand what's going on as far as what we do. And uh, he enjoyed it and it was great. He saw a different perspective of what, what's going on with us. Yeah. And it was a great experience for myself and for him, I think. Oh, yeah. It's always good to do something like yeah. that. I mean, if you guys have a chance to be able to do that, and, and Paul, I know you know some of the people up there. One of the things that we used to do in the Air Force we used to do transition work down at the Miramar, and we actually used to call up the tower down there, and anybody that was in ATC or worked the tower or any of that stuff was welcome to come out and do transitions with us in the in the airplane. And we used to do that all the time. We'd come in and we and <laughs> they'd be out there in groves. They loved it. You know, no, it got them out of the out of the shop too, of course. But uh, they they just love it, and they got to see what that end looked like. Because you know they got F-18s down there, and they don't necessarily get a chance to get rides in those. But when we went down there, they got a ride with us, and it was a lot of fun. It really was, it was a lot of fun. So you know, if you ever get a chance to do that with these guys, do that. Uh, I know that Don brings up, of course, the uh, ROTC students up a lot, which is really neat. And you know, giving these guys rides in the in the T thirty fours. And you've got your T thirty four drivers, you know, you might think about, you know, I know a lot of you asked about people wanting to come. And I know several people on the outside who just love to come out here and fly other things. So keep that in mind. And even with the other airplanes too, you know, I mean, uh, you're flying the 182 or, or uh, the Charlie model, you know, you got seats in that thing to carry all kinds of people in the thing. And there's a lot of people out there that love general aviation or love aviation period, but never had the chance to fly. And I used to have a boss like that many, many years ago and when I went to the Air Force to start flying. He just, he, he was like way up, and it was in the Department of Agriculture, and he was like, you know, the top dude. And he closed the door in the office when I was leaving, you know, leaving to go to the Air Force, and he says, Roger, he says, I would do anything to do what you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, he was very successful in what he did in the Department of Agriculture, but, but he but he always wanted to fly. It was a dream of his, but he never got to ever do it. And uh, the neat thing about it was is that about six months later, I actually got a chance to get permission because he was such a, you know, he was a high up in the Department of Agriculture, I actually got him on a C-141 right. And uh, he absolutely loved it, just loved it. Yeah, we do stuff, you know, we fly airplanes and that's something that, you know, we think because we're around pilots all the time, especially the airline guys, you know, you're all around, you know, pilots, but remember, we're a very small percentage of the whole population that flies, actually gets to really fly an airplane. Uh, even the little ones, whether you're flying, you know, uh, you know, one five Foxtrot or you're flying, you know, for some of you, the DC-10 and the bigger ones, you know, you're doing something that is unique in our society. And, uh, you know, and you want to keep, of course, you know, the good side up, you know, because the news media loves to pick on, especially airlines. Okay, so, nobody has any more?
Greg Miller right here, former F-4 pilot, re retired airline pilot, retired airline pilot. He finally got his wingman patch <laughs> on Friday. <laughs> Break the airplane either. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I was, yeah, I remember what, yeah, when you did that, I, I was break really them, kind I of break surprised. Ice, ice man, you can be my wingman any day. Now, congratulations. Okay, we're going to talk to Bob. You're up, Bob. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, he's up in a second. Uh, okay, and then tonight we're going to talk uh, 2018 top safety focus areas, which uh, what uh, uh, Colonel Hosey's going to talk about, and he's going to give us some uh, pretty neat stuff. I've been over it, and uh, nothing scary. Okay, that was scary. That's just a real quick picture of uh, Cliff when he lost the engine on triple five. Uh, he, uh, up there on the upper left-hand corner is where he turned on that straightaway. He'll, he can explain a whole lot better, but he did one pattern. He came in here and uh, he, on his second round, he said the engine started backfiring right here. And he started coming around, uh, and, I, and of course, as soon as it backfired, he started heading back downwind to get, you know, to get back over here. And uh, the engine really started backfiring really bad right up here. And then as he pulled back on the throttle, the engine quit. So he had to get it back from there all the way back here. He was trying to restart the engine. Down. Where did he touch down? No, he touched up. He Here's the runway. Here's runway 30 right here. Right here. Here's runway 30 right here with the two taxiways. Okay. And he actually touched down here. This is an old runway that goes across and started way down here. Right. That's the old runway. So all this is just beat up asphalt and weeds. And he hit this uh, short of Delta. Okay. And That's stopped down here and then looked at the airplane. Nothing happened on him on this thing. So that's why it's even ready. He straightened it out to get more distance and kept on climbing and got about in here is where it started to go and that's what he was trying to do. So he tried fuel, ox pumps, changed tanks. He said the worst thing is when it quit, he was flying with his right hand and then trying to switch and work the throttle and the mixture control and hit the starter on the other side. Actually, he had it almost started right in here uh, where he touched down. Now, this is off his iPad that he had... Uh, yeah, this is off the uh, tracking that he has uh, on his uh, four flight, yeah. and they and four flight records seven. everything, and so that's that's an actual. Uh, what recording. was the issue with the engine? He'll, he'll come, well, it started back. The history of this thing is, you know, we had the prop over him, so we weren't well, sure what was going on. No. <laughs> that was uh, that was at the uh, San Bernardino Air Show, right. and we found out that was due to low oil in the oil tank. He started with 10 quarts, should have had almost 11 in it when it was cold, 10 after 11, that's where we asked for it to be. So if you take and do and get a start after sitting for a long period of time, you're going to hide a quart in that engine to begin with. So now you're down at 9 quarts, and now you're flying formation. That particular engine will burn a little bit of oil, so now you're down below 9, and it, he lost control of the prop. That's because of low oil that was in the tank. It wasn't scavenging enough to keep the pressure up. So we figured that maybe it was part of that, but that had nothing to do with it. Um, so wh what would cause the backfire? Anybody have an idea on an engine? Anybody know what it... This is one thing I'd like to really talk... We talked about this maybe tonight and some other times too. We need to spend more time on how an engine operates and what we should understand about an engine even in starting and the areas that don't have any oil lubrication uh, in regards to the start. And I hear some of the T-34s, my gosh, when they start them up, they're winding up at 12, 1300 RPM. You realize that there's no cam bearings in a camshaft. All it is is what's drilled in the block and the two halves put together and a film of oil. That's the only thing that protects metal from metal on the cam itself. The rod bearings, the main bearings have bearings in them. They used to be silver, now they're 
Now they're uh, an alloy uh, for the bearings in, in an aircraft engine. We also can get piston slack. So when we pull back the power, sometimes that's when we can break a piston. We break a piston because it begins slapping inside. There's not enough pressure to hold the ring solid on a piston. And then the, the lands in that piston begin to deteriorate and we end up breaking a piston. So there's a lot of things that you need to understand about six six cylinder engines or a radial engine or something else. A lot different than just putting the power to a jet engine and let it go out the back end. So anyway, anybody have any ideas what can cause the backfire of an <coughs> aircraft engine or even a car engine? Isn't well, it, you know, just a super rich mixture that gets <coughs> into the exhaust? Possibly, but where's the start from though? And how does it get through there? Sticking open or so we got a valve. So we either have a sticky valve that's hanging open either by carbon or a broken spring. Because what we're doing, we're pumping that, that engine 555 happens to be a fuel injected engine it was changed over by Fred versus carburetor, even though it's an A model and it's fuel injected. So we're dumping fuel into the into the system by the through the throttle body and it's dumping into the cylinder. Now if I have a, an exhaust valve that's open. It's pumping the raw gas down through the exhaust system and then we fire the internal system and what we do is we cause the explosion because we have atomized gas going out the exhaust so we have these explosions going out the, exa uh, the exhaust. What's the other issue that may cause something? Pardon? No, air in the intake is going to help us do it, but it's ignition, and that's magneto. So, is the magneto failed, and is it misfiring, which means that when the valves are open, that's when it's firing and it'll go out the exhaust the same way. I had one that coming out of Mather years ago, and I, all I did was that I thought I was going to lose the whole bloody engine. I said I didn't want to go down tail first, and uh, I started to circle and just kept climbing, and it smoothed out and went from mixture changed tanks to one mag to the second mag and then it just shook violently again and this did it about three times and I kept climbing and I circled for about 15 minutes and it went went away and I said well I either got a bad injector or I had something wrong with my fuel well come to find out the capacitor everybody knows what a capacitor is it's, it's called a condenser in some things but it's not it's a capacitor the mechanics helper Happened to have the magneto sitting on the bench and the sun just hit it and saw something shiny hitting it. The wire to the capacitor was rubbing against the cam and the vibration would cause it to short out. Just that little bit. And when it did, it misfired. And when it's misfired, that means when the piston's going up, the firing is trying to push the piston down so we have this violent reaction within the engine itself. So anyway, but David G. found a wire today that looks like maybe the answer, which is uh, comes off our new tachometers, and we're going to borescope. I'm not going to do it. Uh, it'll be borescoped on Thursday morning, and we'll double check the valve because the one cylinder is just a little bit low on pressure, but nothing is, is still normal, and see if we have some carbon maybe that's holding that valve open. Check it out. The springs are good. And we'll take and re-sleeve uh, that one particular wire that was shorting out against the uh, firewall. And hope that that's what's in there because everything else is normal right now. Oil smells good. It's got a lot of oil in it and everything. So that's the thing. So what he ended up doing is what he took off is that he got to about three or 400 feet when this engine started really backfiring bad. And evidently it had been backfiring on Friday too with Steve, but you didn't hear it because the people next door heard it when you were downwind prior to your landing when you did a break. So that was the beginning of it. But the magneto, when he was doing the mag checks, all proved positive. In other words, they were, the drop was very low. Nothing shown wrong with that. Got airborne, came back around, took off again, and uh, gets about 400 feet. Starts to uh, backfire. Immediately he turns downwind, continue to climb. That's what he went straight. When you see on the graph, he was going straight. Climbing for altitude. Altitude is very important. 
But also, if the engine quit, where would someone put that airplane? Any ideas where we could put the airplane? We're talking about safety? On the ground. Any flat surface. Any flat surface right there. I don't care if it's taxiway alpha or on the ramp. If you can make one of those areas, you're going to be history. If you can get to the parade ground, everybody know where the parade ground is? The big green patch that's on the south side of the, or the east side of the airport? You can put that airplane in there, gear up, gear down. You're going to make it. And we'll take the wings off and we'll haul it back one way or the other. But anyway, so he turned down wind, and then he started playing with everything, and then the engine quit when he pulled the power back, thinking if he had pulled the power back because he had everything forward, the engine quit. And then he was trying to restart it in flight. He called Mayday. Uh, I think Paul was up there because Paul Actually, called was, uh, me. By, uh, Brian Belrose, who's, who's uh, one of my supervisors, he yeah. was on that day and he's going to be the liaison, so yeah, Brian was working that day. Yeah, so anyway, so it, it, it's just third hand, but I do have the report in, in my office, so I'm kind of relating what's in the report. But uh, turned down when he says, I'm just putting it in. Would it be advantageous even to go against the grain of traffic to get it on the airport? Sure, I want to. Big one, right? You could have done 12. Could have done 14. Actually even if the traffic pattern says we're using 30 and, and 32, because tower will come taking control. Of it. If there's an airplane that's on short final, he's going to, and it's an emergency, he's going to take that one and abort the take the landing traffic to make room for the landing the, the landing aircraft. He'll abort the the one that's in air versus the one that's having the emergency. So think about all these things when things come up, and remember what's the most important thing. When we take off, what are we licking at? Max gross weights and an engine failure. It's the worst time of any time of an airplane that you fly. It's always an emergency for me, even when I was flying DC-10s. I think uh, John over here considers the same thing with American Airlines. Most of the airline captains always look at that because you're looking at max gross weight, a lot of people on board, and if you lose an engine, you better start flying the airplane. So anyway, that's kind of the story from... Uh, uh, Clifton, and unfortunately he's not here, but I just gave the brief for him. But he says he had kind of done a little bit of a pucker. We have ladies in the audience, but, you know, he walked out with clean pants anyway. <laughs> you're done? Mm -hmm. Except when I do more, I got my well, list. Well, you're up now. <laughs> I'm just getting my list. We're lit. <laughs> okay. Next thing I want to talk about real quick, and I'm sorry to take all this time, but it's important. We just put a brand new tire on 03 November. It's had five flights, and I'm missing a sixteenth of an inch of rubber on a new tire. It's got a bald spot that's about this big around, where someone took and landed with their feet on the brakes. We don't do that. Where are the feet supposed to be, everybody? On the floor, right? And even in a crosswind, put them on the floor. Once the, once the airplane gets straightened out, then put your feet up on the brake and start tapping the brake a little bit. Very just using toe pressure, little teeny ticky pose. Board ship, they could take and park my blade this far from the from the island. The guy would just do this with his head. That means he just wanted a light brake. Some guys he kind of does this over here. I want a real heavy brake. But I was I was always easy. Save the battery, guys. When you land and you got all the lights on, what light do you need to have on that most during the day is the rotating beacon. Turn everything else off so that when you're at low RPM, you'll be charging the battery for the next person. And we're going to try this to see if we can save our batteries versus let them drain down with all of our uh, electrical system on. Pull off the runway, turn off the lights, raise the flaps, get all that stuff going, switch the ground control, you don't have to taxi any way they know where you are. Call ground control after you get everything shut off except for the rotating beacon. And if at night, you got to have the nav lights on and a taxi light. Uh, scheduling. 03 is going to be down probably in, in another 20, 25 hours. And it'll be down for maybe a week. So I can't tell you when it's going to happen, but more than likely at the end of the month. So people who have schedules for January, you may get canceled while we do the 100 hours since that's the only airplane we have. The other engine for 29 Foxtrot, which is in Hemet, is now at Oceanside, and we're next in line to get it rebuilt. He's going to try and put it out as fast as we can. So what we're doing on that one is going through all the lower block with all new bearings, remanufactured rods, new pistons, new cylinders, overhauled carburetor, rebuilt starter, rebuilt generator, 
and new uh, gas lines. So when we get it back, we'll have it all set for the for the students and our training program. Um, on the credit cards, some of you don't forget three-digit code. We got the little gouge up there. Just remind on that. And for cleaning, don't forget we got the struts, the wings, the windscreen, and most of all the fuselage. If you see oil down there, put some squirt on there, get a rag and wipe it off. I don't care if you use a greasy rag or not, but try and, and help us out by keeping the fuselage clean. And we're now ready for our... You want to talk about leaning there? Leaning in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, the other thing, too, for the 03, for uh, individuals flying 03, and including the T-34s with fuel injection. Let's take and lean them out a little bit. All you got to do is pull out the... the uh, Pull it out just a little bit to lean it out, and then when you do your run up, make sure you got it in rich. So that's going to help us keep the uh, it's going to help us keep our plugs clean and uh, reduce a lot of uh, uh, issues when it comes to some of the maintenance and and some of the magneto stuff. So I kind of did a pre brief on on what you uh, uh, did. You're He'll next. put it back up. So. <laughs> You want to go back up? I told them about how you experienced this from what you gave me. You're more than welcome to have people. We talked about what can cause something. It's either a valve or ignition to be fuel, but we've kind of isolated now to ignition. And uh, uh, so I kind of took the wind out of your sails. I'm yeah. sorry, there, Colonel. Go ahead. Clear. Come on up. We weren't sure when you were going to get back yeah. in here, so I just kind of well, keep things moving here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing we want to know did did. Uh, I don't know what what, he, what they've uh, uh, briefed already, but uh, on Saturday I went out to do a local uh, just pattern three takeoff and landings in triple uh, uh, five uh, Zulu Zulu. So, long story short, normal taxi, normal uh, run up, nothing that I was aware of. Took off and it was about 500 feet, 80 knots. Started to make my right hand turn to enter right downwind and. <laughs> and uh, so uh, did did one did one pattern fine uh, when I was here on the first part, as soon as I brought the power back uh, to probably about 15 uh, inches of uh, manifold pressure it was backfiring so nothing outrageous at that point just backfired so came back in uh, did a low approach come back came back around and right here right at this spot right here, I was 500 feet, 80 knots, and brought the power slowly back, and <coughs> back, it's just started backfiring, and uh, on the attack, it was going back between 2100 and 2300 on, on the tack. It was just fluctuating, and it seemed like it was fluctuating with every time it was backfiring. So at that point, I just firewalled everything. I just remember bringing the throttle, the prop, made sure the mixture was straight up, and at this point, you can see I just leveled the wings to try to figure out what was going on with the uh, engine. It was, even though everything was firewall, it wasn't developing any power. So prop wouldn't come up, manifold pressure was uh, low, it was like below 20 uh, inches. So at that point, I remember, I think, okay, I can't clear it this way, but I remember just from my training that if it's backfiring, bring it back and then hopefully then if you bring the power back again forward smoothly maybe it'll clear that uh, the backfire well as soon as I brought it back uh, it quit so you can see immediately where it quit right here I turned customs was just uh, launching a uh, 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 what, are the, what is there a little plotus plotus yeah. so they heard it backfire and heard it quit so they got in a golf cart and they started over here so they were thinking I was going to land on on uh, Gerber or one of the main streets out here, they didn't think I was going to make it because at that point I was pretty I was pretty low. Uh, so right off the bat, I went. For, I knew was, I was in the left tank. I went to the right tank. I hit the right boost pump and continued the turn. I knew I could make this easy, no problem at all. I knew I could make that. I had enough altitude. I was probably only about 300 feet right about here, so I knew I could make that. So I initially started there. Hoping it would windmill, but when it didn't windmill, then I said, okay, I'm going to try at least try the starter. One of the things is when you're flying a stick with the right and the starter is in the far right hand corner, guess what? You can't reach it. I don't care what you do with the short horn stuff, you cannot reach it. So 
as I'm trying to turn, keeping my airspeed. That was the biggest thing in my thing was keep my airspeed up. Your speed is life, right? So I didn't care about the altitude. I knew I could land on the ramp, the taxiway, the infield there because it's all old runways. So at that point I have to switch hands. Now I'm hitting the starter. And it's turning over and it's, it's trying to start, but it's just not starting. So at that point I realized, okay, I have to, I'm going to have to land. So I called Mayday. Let them know that I was going for the uh, infield. They said, are you going to be able to make it to, uh, they thought I was going to go for 3-2. For, uh, I said, no, I can't make 3-2 or 1-4. Or I think they actually asked me if I was going to make 1-4 because of the direction I was at. So I said, no, I'm going to make the, uh, the infield. I think I can make it to the overrun of 3-0. And that's basically what it is. Right at the last minute, literally, just as I got into the flare, I mean, I literally landed. Here's Delta. I landed only uh, maybe 100 feet from Delta, right on the overrun. Uh, probably was the nicest landing I ever made, honestly. <laughs> yeah, but it was all I was doing was just trying to keep the airspeed. But literally, just as I flared for the landing, the engine coughed and started, but very, but, but rugged. So I shut everything off. They the crash rescue came out just to make sure everything was okay. We checked the airplane. Besides grass in the nose gear, sorry that you guys had to clean all the grass out. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, yes, sir. Did, did you think about bringing back the prop past the beacon? Yes, I did. I actually, uh, from my and I think I I talked to the guys before. That was actually one of the very short final uh, when I was still wondering if I was going to make the, the you know the overrun. I did bring everything, I, I brought everything back. So just like, you know, identify, verify, feather, you know, I brought it back to low RPM. Uh, but at that point, to be honest with you, I don't think it really made really any difference. Uh, there, maybe there was enough oil pressure in there to have done it, but I, you know, I don't know. These aren't auto feathering, uh, so uh, I'm not aware, I don't, I don't know if that really made any difference at all. The biggest thing was that is, as soon as you anticipate that you've got a problem, you know, I turned immediately towards, back towards the airfield, you know, someplace I knew I could land. Then I worked it as long as I could work it, but then it became apparent at 300 feet and only 80 knots, and it's not developing power. I've got everything full forward, and it's just not developing, uh, you know, RPMs or manifold pressure. I mean, it was stuck where it was at, and it was not enough to sustain flight. Uh, so then I made that commitment to go ahead and land. Uh, I, I had already put the gear down. It was, I don't know why, just instinct. As soon as I started, I just hit the gear. Uh, I know it's you know, electrically operated, but you know, back just from your, you know, when you fly, you know, all the different aircraft, you know, you just try to get everything on your side. And I thought, while this thing's still windmilling, I'm gonna get the gear down, you know, and uh, when I knew I was committed, I got the flaps down, and I just remember turning, you know, turning the master switch off and bringing everything back, and, uh, but, you know, in the long run, you know, no, that was really necessary because I was I was really able to make the 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 overrun of uh, runway to three zero. Um, I'm still not quite sure. I guess they were looking at you know there was a little bit of a valve that was sticking, and then the ignition. But I haven't heard completely what it, yeah, we, what they have found. They but, found a wire that may be short and out from the tachometer, which goes to the magneto. But I guess one of the lessons I wanted to talk about is if you're flying an aircraft and something happens, it's some Make sure to mention it because what happened on Friday, it was flying, and I, a couple of us had been just coming in when 5 5 came in. And when they came to bring the throttle back on downwind of beam, it was backfiring a lot. And that's not normal. You know, that's not, that's not normal. Don't know if they didn't hear it or what, but uh, didn't even think about that until after this all you know, happened that, oh, you know, it had been back, backfiring pretty bad. Even customs. That day had talked about when they came out it was the same guys who'd been on the ramp the day before. They said, "Hey, did you know that that thing was really backfiring on Friday when it came in from the uh, doing the formation flight?" I says, "Yeah, I didn't know if that was that for sure, but now that you mention it, you know, I do remember because I was in the parking lot just walking walking in for my afternoon student. Uh, so you know, just for all of us, if there's something that's just not right, make sure to, if nothing else, mention it to Bob or maintenance if they're if they're here. And if you're really not sure." Just write it down. If nothing else, you make this can come out. It's checked okay. It's all right, and you know, and sign it off. Uh, but like I said, I, other than that, I don't really know what other lessons learned except for the fact that you know if something like that happens. You know, in this case, you know, I was fortunate enough that 
the runway was close enough by, you know, I tried everything that I had known, I have been taught to, to do, to, to keep it flying, but on that particular day, it was just backfiring so bad that when I reduced that power to, you know, try to bring it back to idle power and then slowly bring it back up to see if it cleared, it, it just quit at that point. So, I don't know if there's anything else for the guys that even have more experience than the T-34 than I I don't know if there's anything else I could have done at that point. Um, but it just wouldn't develop power, and so my only option at that point was, you know, turn towards, uh, you know, where I knew I could make the ground. Were you full rich for most of this episode? Yes, I was not here. I had it leaned out here, put full rich on takeoff, and normally, uh, if I'm just going to be in a pattern, I will bring it back a little bit, and I did try that. Now, to get started again, once we landed, I had to bring it back quite a bit to get it started, and then it, and then it. It started, but it still was running pretty rough. There was something wrong. It, it was not developing full power even at, at, at taxi. Okay. Okay. Now, the only thing I got to say is that you students of Cliff, you, you might want to, you know, this makes second time with Cliff and one of his students when the engine quit. <laughs> so, uh, I. I can tell you that Cliff's students are going to be the most uh, taught, the most, what do you call it? Emergency, uh, emergency landings. Emergencies, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, if you run early, learn that stuff, then you'll become his student. Good job, Cliff. Definitely. Okay, uh, let's see. It's 20 minutes till. Eight, and we want to make sure we get out of here, so we'll go into the retired Colonel. Oh. Yeah, wake up. Okay. <laughs> Cliff, nice job. Thank you. Uh, good lessons learned, and thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> Sully has nothing on you. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> Keep it in the water, like a though. a big book deal. <laughs> yeah, he's a millionaire. It should go through. <laughs> you needed condition lever though, like C 130, yeah. throw that prop. Yes. That wouldn't work. Um, I spoke last month at the safety meeting on loss control and flight a little bit and then showed a video. Was everybody here? Okay. Brief introduction. Um, 30 years in the Air Force flying, C 130s for 10 years, C 5s for 18. We did a lot of boss flights, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and when we did air refueling missions, we normally up in Massachusetts at Westover, it involved Bangor, the guard unit there for tankers, and Pease. The Pease folks would come down to Westover, we'd load them on the airplane and go up and do an air refueling behind the Pease tanker. They really enjoyed that. Okay. Yep. Um, also, 15 years in corporate aviation, CVS Pharmacy, ran that flight department for 15 years, stepped down three year, uh, four years ago, um, flying uh, Citation 10s and Falcon 2000s. So, last, a week and a half ago, I was asked to speak at the AAAE. Anybody know what that is? That's the American Association for Airport, of Airport Executives. Uh, that was down in Long Beach. And they asked me to come in and speak about operation stuff uh, and what the NBAA safety committee has been focusing on every year every January and that's coming up the end of this January um, the end of January we sit down and have a risk assessment meeting and we decide on what are the top focus areas from the National Business Aviation Association safety committee should we get out to the community and have them think about so I was asked to come in and share that along with some other data. So let me uh, let me run through this. Of course, that was to, uh, and by the way, the airport executives were from all over the country, but mostly the big airports, Atlanta, Boston, uh, Midway, Chicago, San Fran, all of the airports in this region, uh, San Diego, so forth. But we, as I mentioned, we highlight every year the top safety focus items. I'm going to run through these real quick. I'm not going to read all of them because we're a little bit short on time. <clears throat> but
But the first one that I talked about last week, was, or last month, was loss of control in flight. Big difference between military aviators and general aviation pilots is that general aviation pilots don't spend any time upside down. They get stall recovery. How many, how many of you have less than 100 hours? Okay, great. Good, good audience. How many have been upside down on an airplane? Okay. Of the new pilots under 100 hours, how many of you have been upside down on an airplane? Okay. You've done stall recovery. You know how to get out of that. You know what the, the envelope for the airplane is. But do you know what the envelope is for being upside down at, at a slow airspeed and trying to recover? <clears throat> Loss of control in flight is the number one killer in aviation today, whether it's general aviation or 121 operators, it doesn't matter. Anywhere in this country, all around the world, loss of control in flight. Next on the list is runway excursions. And I'm going to include incursions here because I've got some data on incursions. Nearly a third of business aviation accidents are runway incursions, and that's general aviation as well. That's a big number. Runway excursions are often survivable. Are they preventable? And the answer is, yeah, sure they are. Um, it drives a staggering annual injury and damage toll estimate at 900 million industry-wide, on an average, and, and so forth. Shifting percep perceptions and behaviors to, uh, to increase the uh, procedural adoption of approach and landing best practices in aviation represents difficult challenges still ahead. Single pilot accident rate. Accident rates are consistently higher for single pilots op <clears throat> operated aircraft who are 30% more likely to be involved in an accident than a dual pilot, pilot crew. Single pilots generally have a sole responsibility for the overall enterprise supported by